on campus are continuing in Pensolving Hall, our parish hall. And I would anticipate in the next five to seven minutes, uh, our gathered people with Kathy Comer, our speaker, will be back. So I would invite you just to keep your live stream running and you should see us regather.
All right, beloved. If we can gather back up, it's time for our our third and final plenary presentation from our speaker Kathy Comer. Just looking at the rest of the schedule. Uh, at the end, of, once we have completed this presentation, we'll go back over for small group and Q&A with Kathy until right at about, about noon, 11.45 to noon in that time frame. When that winds down, I invite you to come back over to, to the church for a very, very humble and simple celebration of the Holy Communion with a little period of meditation, but we will take communion and being in stage three here at All Saints, with, even though you'll see me bless the bread and the wine, we do we receive the bread only, which is a full communion, but it is, in a, it is with the intent of protecting all of us. So, so Kathy, we are delighted again that you're here. Thank Welcome you. back to your podium. Thank you all for hanging in here with us throughout this weekend. So what I have here in, in this, this uh, final session is really to kind of just share a few closing thoughts with you, uh, give you a few more reflections. I was reminded though, Gabe, when you were telling the story about the Baha'is meeting here, that uh, Merrill mentioned this story last night. It is part of the series of stories. Again, if you are interested in reading those, they're called Moving Forward in Truth, and they can be found on the diocesan website. There are about 20 or so of them. But he mentioned the story that was saying the long way to Austin. And that story is really about um, the general convention. And general convention was supposed to come to Texas in 1955. And they rescinded their acceptance of the invitation by the then Bishop, uh, not Quinn, the one before him. How did I lost that, that quickly? Uh, anyway, uh, they, they rescinded the invitation because an incident had occurred in council a couple of years before that where the white residents uh, or, or, or delegates to council refused to eat in the same room 
with the black delegates who were attending. And when the bishop learned of this, Quinn is, I couldn't remember. <laughs> when the bishop learned of this, he was really quite upset about it. And they ensured that that would never happen again where you had attendees who had been elected to come and serve as, as delegates uh, to represent the council. Well, anyway, this, the word of that didn't just stop here. And so, whereas the House of Bishops agreed or ex to accept the invitation, the House of Deputies did not, or they rescinded the invitation and refused to come here because they felt that if they brought people from around the country here, they would not be received well in Texas. And uh, interestingly enough, when council was held, when general convention was held here, was it 2018? Uh, the raves, the reviews came in, glowing re re reviews about the great hospitality of Texas and receiving. Now, General Convention did come here once in the 70s, I think. But the fact that we had come to that place where 2018, the General Convention met here in Austin. And wouldn't you know that at that time, Bishop Curry, Michael Curry, the first African-American uh, presiding bishop, would be over the church when it held its general convention here in Texas. And it, the, I first became familiar with that story. My husband is a, you know how y'all like to call yourselves, cradle Episcopalians. Uh, his father was a, an Episcopal priest in Southwest Florida. And one of the stories actually, that I include in the series actually is an exchange of letters between my husband's father, who was much, much older when he had these children, uh, and between my husband's father and Bishop, uh, I think it was Quinn, one, the, whoever the bishop was around that time, uh, where the bishop from Texas was writing to Father John Colmer, who was an archdeacon in Southwest Florida, asking for his advice on race relations. Well, I first became familiar with that story about general convention from my mother-in-law, who was part of the group who went to Honolulu. So instead of, they punished themselves by not coming to Texas, by going to Honolulu. <laughs> <laughs> and she had gone, that was her only general convention that she had attended, and she went to that one in Honolulu. So that got my interest going on that. All right. Here's a, another poem that I wrote for one of the series or used on one of those stories. It's called, What's My Name? And I think it's fitting following a session where we talk about having the singular story. And if nothing else, I would hope with the little activity that we did with the Jesus picture, with the, sh the anecdotes that I shared, perhaps we'll look a little deeper at people when we see them going forward and realize that what we see is not all that there is to be seen, even in the worst of us, and that initially that we will be reminded that all of us from the beginning, we don't necessarily know yet what that means, but we were made in the image of our creator, and there was no distinction made. And that breath that God passed on, that Ruah breath that had hovered above the waters at creation, that God himself breathed into that human being that he created is the breath that resides in each of us. What's my name? You don't even know me. What's my name? Though we are all human, we are not, nor were we intended to all be the same. You don't even know me. What's my name? More alike than we are different, you consider me less than. Refuse to lend a helping hand, persecute me, ridicule me, and cause me shame. You don't even know me. What's my name? You've never met me face to face, yet for the problems of the world, it's me you blame. You don't even know me. What's my name? You never looked into my eyes, touched me, considered me, cho chose instead to believe the lies and despise. What a shame. You look at me and judge because we don't look the same. You look, but you don't see. You don't know me. You slander and defame. I pose some threat to you, you claim. But this is my life and not a game. My life and not a game. Why don't you get to know me so you can see who I am and call me? 
by my right name. The last story that we will just think about, ponder here, well, it's a passage of scripture, is found in Galatians 2. And in this, this particular scenario, Paul is confronting Peter. And the version I'm going to read you comes from the Living Bible. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him publicly. This is Paul talking, speaking strongly against what he was doing, for it was just wrong. For when he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile Christians who don't, who don't bother with circumcision and the many other Jewish laws. But afterwards, when some Jewish friends of his, of James, came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore because he was afraid of what these Jewish legalists who insisted that circumcision was necessary for salvation, what they would say if they saw him eating with the Gentiles. And then all the other Jewish Christians and even Barnabas became hypocrites too, following after Peter's example, though they certainly knew better. When I saw what was happening and they weren't being honest about what they really believed and weren't following the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all those others, though you are a Jew by birth, you have long since discarded the Jewish law, so why all of a sudden are you trying to make these Gentiles obey them? You know, church folk are good about that. <laughs> they don't follow the rules, but, you know, y'all better follow them. You and I are Jews by birth, not mere Gentile sinners, and yet we Jewish Christians know very well that we cannot become right with God by obeying our Jewish laws. And the only way we can do that is by faith in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And so we too have trusted Jesus Christ that we might be accepted by God because of faith and not because we have obeyed the Jewish laws. For no one will ever be saved by obeying the law. It will behoove us all to remember that. One of the challenges that the church faces today is, and I've been t having some great conversations with Miriam and her generation. I found out she was the age of my daughter. <laughs> but one of the challenges of the church that the church faces today is authenticity. Am I right? Oftentimes when you ask young people why they don't go to church, it's because we are accused the church is viewed as being, a, well, hypocritical. Somebody said something? Say it? Hip, being hypocritical. That we are not authentic. We preach a gospel, but do not live it. I have this thing I wrote, it was like believing versus believing how we live out what it is that we profess to believe. Paul in this passage suggests we are being disingenuous or hypocritical in our faith when our actions are not aligned with our beliefs or when such congruency exists only under certain set of circumstances or is dependent on the company we are keeping. Uh, I, I wanted to share this story. Uh, this one involved, kind of, sort of, kind of involved All Saints. This was one of the stories, too. It was about the integration of St. Andrew's Episcopal School. Y'all know that story? How they were. Good you're here, Sue, too, because that that's, that's included in there, too. And I found this story, because, y'all, I was digging everywhere trying to find these stories last year. <laughs> digging everywhere. And I found, I had the good fortune to find a thesis that was written by a woman named Caroline Booth Pinkston, who lives here in Austin. And she once, at once taught at St. Andrews. And uh, she was working on a thesis for her master's at UT. And she wrote this on the integration of St. Andrews Episcopal School in Austin. The thesis is entitled, The Gospel of Justice, Community, Faith, and the Integration of St. Andrew's Episcopal School. 
St. Andrews, though it was a church school, is it still? was one of the last schools, public or private, to integrate, to comply with the mandate of the Austin public school system to integrate. And part of what prompted this, this, this article, this story, that her research and so forth was, was predicated on an incident that occurred around 1960. And, um, they still were not integrated, as were some schools, but the, the mandate had been set out there. And there was a woman who was a member of St. James, I don't know whether you know this story or not, who sent a letter asking for her children to be admitted to school at St. Andrews. And the priest even, who was a white priest at that time, even spoke up to her, spoke to her character and so forth. Uh, supposedly what prompted her trying to get her children in was uh, the fact that the school, they were attending another Christian school and it closed and so they were trying to get entry into this. And uh, Miss Pink's, is that Bertha Means? Bertha Means. it was Bertha Means? Yeah. Oh, is that who it was? Founder of St. James. I thought it was another lady. It, but did Bertha Means teach at, at UT? Her husband did. No, 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 her husband because the, the, the story, the, the woman that was referenced here actually ended up being the first African-American to teach at UT, according to the information that she provided there. So there may be a, a time, because her child, this lady's children never got to go there. They voted her down, voted her down. They would not accept them in there. And that was the point of the whole story, that they would not let, for me, or a significant point that was made that they wouldn't allow this woman to let her children come to school there. And when they finally did integrate in 1963, it was because, now the school was supposedly not, it was not under the ownership of St. Andrews as, as I understood this, but that all saints and St. David's and other churches were part of the governing board. And it was only upon their insistence and the threat that um, that St. Andrews was going to was was not going to be able to continue as part stay in the Episcopal Church. Only then did they finally agree to integrate. The uh, April 26, 1961, Texas Observer put it this way: Integration in Austin took a novel turn Thursday, featuring an inter-Episcopalian squabble over segregated St. Andrews School. And again, I said what this was prompted by. And she says, um, uh, even though the woman wanted her children, and I didn't include her name in here, uh, probably for the first, the same reason. I didn't want any confusion, and that wasn't the point of the story. But the St. Andrews Board voted finally, after full and open discussion, to deny the admission of these two boys and to continue the operation of their school on a segregated basis. When they finally voted to move forward with integrating, the votes were cast by secret ballot <laughs> for fear that those voting on being associated with a pro-segregation vote, for fear, and it only, vo only won by a four margin vote. They also voted not to officially notify the parents of the decision for fear that, that is the, the, the parents of the children already at St. Andrews, for fear that they would leave the school in large numbers if they learned about it. One day I had this thought. It's like God said, I'll make them all the same. I'll just make them in different colors and not tell them. The only way we could ever possibly know of our likenesses would be if we were willing to talk to one another and find out. Perhaps the hardest part is getting together, sitting down and talking and listening to each other to find out about our commonalities. In this story of St. Andrews, we are reminded again that while legislation is necessary to bring about change, a change of heart cannot be legislated. 
That is perhaps an issue we are still coming to more fully realize. As Bishop Hines said back then during that time, we as Christ followers are moved not as much by court decisions as we are, or I might add, as we should be by the demands of the gospel. The question remains, but it's certainly worth the continued pursuit of an answer. How do we truly see people or change the way that we look at them or the way that we treat them? My answer is one story at a time, one encounter at a time. So God made human beings in the image of God. In the image of God, God created the male and female. God created them. And God looked on all that God had made and saw that it was very good. Amen. So we will go over to the, to the room again. We will have a few minutes. There are a few more questions for you to consider, to share, and then you get to ask me some questions if you have any. And I would um, encourage folks to be in the same groups as earlier, just because you've already started those conversations and created a sense of trust and intimacy. So if you can find those same folks that way, um, one, it'll be easier, and two, you can continue the conversation from the starting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know what? Oh, okay. 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 O